There are some who will decry Valentine's Day as a cruel reminder of the aching, bitter chill of loneliness that echoes through your apartment as you watch all the little people, all the little people down below going on their little dates and holding each other's little hands while your heart hears the whisper of, it's not for you. It's for everybody else, but not for you. This is a specific type of love from which you, alone, are forever barred. But not me, not me. I'm not one of those people. I say celebrate love. I say happy Valentine's Day. I say eat some chocolate, wear red lipstick, and gosh darn it, let's watch a rom-com. Hello, my beautiful lonely angels, and welcome back to my channel. My name is Summer, and today we're going to talk about a specific type of rom-com ideal for those who don't have a little hand to hold. Something that allows you to celebrate Valentine's in all its paper-hearted glory while hushing up those silly little whispers that say, it's you, it's you. It's something about you specifically that scares everybody away. <laughs> Scariness is actually the key. Now I haven't quite figured out what I want to call this genre, but there is three boxes that it must check. Number one, it must undeniably be a romance. The driving force pushing the story forward has got to be these two people falling in love. I need to feel as giddy about these two people kissing as I do watching Katherine Heigl and James Marsden kiss after the Benny and the Jet scene in 27 Dresses. Two, it must be funny. Dark comedy is fine, but we're not looking for any moody dramas. We're not looking for any dramatic romances. If I wanted to be sad and moody about somebody's romantic journey, I'd watch the 1990s TV miniseries of Phantom of the Opera starring Charles Dance, and that's not the vibe we're going for. Finally, number three, it must be scary. Now, I'm not talking, you know, hereditary levels of scare or uncomfortably gory or, you know, demonic. I don't want you worrying that you summoned anything into your house trying to celebrate a little romance. No, I'm thinking more 80s levels of scare where it gives you some anxiety. You want to close your eyes at part or you might be yelling at the screen. Hey, 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 get out of there, get out of there, get out of there. But you're not going to have nightmares that something's in your closet, you know? <laughs> Plus, I feel like I could fist fight Michael Myers if I wanted to. I could fist fight him and win. And you might be saying, no, you couldn't. I could. If Laurie Strode could do it, I could. You want to know why? Because I'm not lingering by the door while he's still lying on the floor. I'm leaving the house. I'm, I'm, I'm knocking him down and I'm leaving the house. And I'm getting the cops. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, tangent, tangent, tangent. This is actually a surprisingly difficult niche to find movies in. There are some, like Happy Death Day, that almost fit the bill. That one specifically has a very sweet romance, it's got great comedy, but it falls a little bit too much into both the slasher and Groundhog Day slash time loop categories to really fit the bill perfectly. The driving force there is more the mystery. Why does the final girl's day keep repeating rather than the romance? That's more of a secondary plot. So far, there's really only been one movie that fits the bill. It's actually the movie that inspired the bill. It's the movie that after I watched it on Valentine's Day in 2013 with my friends, I went into the nearest law office and I said, please, somebody help me draft a bill to quantify exactly what genre this movie falls in. And then I slapped my ticket for warm bodies onto the receptionist's desk. Warm Bodies follows R, a quiet, introspective guy who feels out of step with his peers and somewhat aimless. And it also follows Julie, a spunky freethinker who's constantly butting heads with her somewhat controlling father. Why is her father so controlling, I hear you asking. Oh, well, it's because he's the governor general of what might be the last bastion of human survivors in the wreckage of a zombie apocalypse. And R, he's a zombie. It's Romeo and Juliet. You get it? It's Romeo, it's R and Julie, it's, Rome. it's Romeo and Juliet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's Romeo and Juliet. R is a zombie and he cannot remember anything about his life before he died, except from the fact that he thinks his name starts with the letter R. And he's constantly gathering little trinkets and reminders of human life that he finds interesting. And he's left wondering if he's the only one who thinks or feels the way that he does. This is because, you know, as zombies, they've lost a lot of their motor function and ability to speak and or think and or feel. And the only time he really connects with others is when him and his horde go shuffle off to go hunt human brains. 
Mm-hmm. I gotta stop saying mm-hmm at the end of everything. I don't know why I'm like mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You've been in, you've been promoted. You are now one of our elite employees. <laughs> All this changes when R sees Julie. She's on a mission with her friends to collect supplies and his horde attacks her posse. You know, classic tale of horde meets girl. And his little zombie mind is just blown when he sees this vision in khaki come slide out from behind cover to start blasting zombies. He then proceeds to eat her boyfriend's brains, rubs his stinky rotten blood on her so no one can smell her sweet human scent, and takes her back to his airplane bunker where they montage their way into understanding and respecting each other. This causes his heart to start beating again, and their love inspires others to come back to life. There's a final showdown, two houses, both alike in dignity, a corpse by any other name would smell as sweet, balcony scene, final battle, and a much happier ending than the bard gave his Juliet and her Romeo. Warm Bodies is great. It's funny. It's sweet, it makes you want to reach out and connect with your fellow man. And I love the nods to Shakespeare, of course. R for Romeo, Julie for Juliet. Juliet's dead boyfriend, Perry, is a stand-in for Paris. R's best friend, M, is Mercutio. And Julie's best friend wants to be a nurse. So, you see, you see, the connections, they connect. And this movie checks every box. One, undeniably a romance. As a retelling of Shakespeare's most iconic star-crossed lovers, it is all about that romance, baby. You've got your hero who's charming, shy, a little decayed, but also sweet. And then you've got your heroine who's bold and brave and understanding. She's hopeful for the future and willing to see the best in people. The movie gives their love plenty of time to develop, deviating from the love at first sight trope from the original. In Julie's case, at least, R was clearly smitten from the beginning. We get to see them going from enemies to reluctant allies to bonding over music and games. He rescues her several times from certain death and she reteaches him how to live. It's fantastic. It's great. So by the time you finally reach the kiss at the end, it feels earned. It feels believable and it's just charming. It's a, it's just a charming little story. And it also has a lovely little through line about the beauty of being human and what it means to be alive. And if I love one thing, it's a story about the beauty of being human and what it means to be alive. Two, the movie must be funny. Absolutely. This movie is built on R's comedic inner dialogue. While the world outside of his brain may be a little bit dismal, he always has a funny little wry observation or some sort of quip, and the awkwardness of him bringing a living human girl back to his rotting airplane full of weird stuff is played to perfection. It's just played to perfection. And you get some great comedic moments with the other zombies as they start coming back to life. Three, it's gotta be scary. Am I gonna have nightmares after watching Warm Bodies? No. That's not what this is for. But did it have me going, go, 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 at the screen several times? <laughs> yes, it did. Well, yes. The zombies have some scary moments themselves, of course, especially in those first initial battles. But the true antagonists are the bonies. These are zombies so far gone that they basically look like living skeletons. Now, the bonies are played a little bit differently in the book, but I won't get into that here. That's not the point of this. The bonies are the culmination of what happens to a zombie when it completely loses its humanity and turns into a monster that will eat literally anything with a pulse. Which is a problem when our main girl has a pulse and her love with our main guy starts making other zombies who are not as far gone as the bonies um, they ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine. You just can't get into it because they would never run. This is a problem when our main girl has a pulse and her and R's love story is inspiring others to come back to life. The chase scenes with the bonies are well done, giving you just enough of that anxious move, move, get in the car right now, what are you doing? Feeling that one wants in a scary movie and giving you that little edge of why are you walking away without closing that door? Close the door, what if something gets inside? feeling that you you look for in a scary movie. Warm Bodies checks all three boxes. It hits all the right notes. It leaves you with those warm, fuzzy feelings. But because there are an awful lot of rotting, reanimated corpses shuffling around a dystopian cityscape instead of shuffling off this mortal coil, it leaves you with just enough adrenaline and distress to keep you from slipping into despair. Sure, maybe you don't have anybody to buy you roses or a small pink teddy bear, but at least you aren't fighting for your life in a gutted stadium. And, and, if an army of the undead can somehow find a way to sneak a little love back into their lives, well then maybe you can too.
For the past 11 years, no other movie has so perfectly fit into this genre. I don't know, it the the scary sweet, the romantic horror, the the comedy del mort, I don't know. Like comedia com, com, comedia del arte, but it's romance de mort. I don't know. Romantic romantic horror rom-coms doesn't roll off the tongue, but whatever. For the past 11 years, no other movie has fit that bill. However, that may all be about to change. As I film this, there is a movie that has just released in theaters. Eagerly, I have been awaiting this film. The trailers seem to indicate that it is a romance. The script, written by Diablo Cody, known for Juno and Jennifer's body. And there are undeniably horror elements to this movie. I'm gonna be right back. I gotta go watch Lisa Frankenstein, and I'll tell you what I think. Okay, I'm back, fresh from the theater where I just saw Lisa Frankenstein, and it was good. Do we have a contender, though? Does it meet my very exacting standards? Does it qualify to be called a... And I still have not figured out a name for this genre. It probably already has a name, but I don't feel like looking it up. So, you know what? You know what? Let's just get into it. Spoilers ahead for Lisa Frankenstein. I'm not going to go into a crazy amount of detail, but... You know, just a heads up. <laughs> also, just so you know, I'm fully reading the script because it's 1 a.m. And this eye makeup that I did is a little wonkier than I'd like it to be. So we're just going to keep the sunglasses on and act like that's on purpose. All right. Lisa Frankenstein follows Lisa Swallows, the new kid in school. She moved into town after her dad remarried and now lives with her uptight stepmother, her perfect popular stepsister Taffy, and Lisa, well, she's got a bit of a reputation. On top of all these big life changes, Lisa's still reeling from the death of her mother. A very traumatic event. I'm talking Michael Myers, Jason, Freddy, 80s slashers level of trauma, my loves. <laughs> I don't know who I am in these sunglasses. And she actually spent somewhere in the neighborhood of six months unable to speak due to trauma. Though time has passed and she has found her voice, she's very quiet, and the kids at school see her as a little off-putting and strange. So she spends the majority of her time in the peace and quiet of the woods, in a nice little abandoned and rumored to be haunted cemetery specifically for unmarried men, aptly called Bachelor's Grove Cemetery. And she finds herself particularly drawn to a specific grave that has the bust of a handsome man. One night, Lisa and her stepsister Taffy, who's a delight, by the way, go to a party. Lisa was mostly sticking to Pepsi, but she gets peer pressured into taking a little sip of something stronger. That ends up being laced with something way stronger than that. Now, what have we learned? We've learned to, to not give in to peer pressure. Isn't that right, kids? Isn't that right? These are the lessons we must take from movies of this nature. Anyway, she manages to wander away from the party in her adult state and finds her way back to her favorite cemetery and the bust of the handsome man, just as a lightning storm is beginning to brew. She sees the face of this handsome man carved in stone, and she wishes out loud that she could be with him. She goes home, lightning strikes, because this wouldn't be a Frankenstein retelling if lightning didn't strike, and Cole Sprouse rises from the grave as the creature and shambles off to get his girl and some new body parts. A heads up to anybody going to watch this, it is rated R, so it does have some more adult themes and subject matter. So let's get into some of the details. I really liked the character of Lisa. Catherine Newton strikes just the right balance of absurd drama and awkwardness in her performance. And the lighting, sets, and costumes were amazing. This movie was an 80s feast for the eyes. And it also included some really cool artistic sequences that paid homage to the silent film, A Trip to the Moon some parts in black and white, some parts that were animated. It had a really cool visual style, great movie to look at. It reminded me visually in a lot of ways of Edward Scissorhands with the brightly colored cookie cutter houses, while thematically it reminded me more of Heather's. But 
Does it check the boxes? That is the question we have today. And this is where I'm gonna get into more spoiler territory. One, undeniably a romance. And I'm gonna say soft yes. By the end, it struck that perfect balance of weird and romantic that the trailers promised, but it was a little rocky throughout. The driving force behind the story was 100% these two characters falling in love, but the pacing of it was a little off. Throughout the movie, there's this other boy that Lisa has this long-standing crush on, and when the creature is fresh from the grave, fetid and reeking of rot, she, understandably, does not see him as a romantic prospect. As the movie goes on, though, and the creature gets a little cuter each time he goes into the malfunctioning tanning bed, they start having more moments. But rather than these moments building on each other slowly and leading to her sort of forgetting about the other guy, she keeps waffling back and forth between the two in a way that doesn't really make sense with the flow of the story. Now listen, I'm not saying that she has to like him just because she wished him back to life and his first act after shuffling back onto this mortal coil was to seek her out and kiss her hand. It's more that they introduced the element of Lisa not liking the creature immediately, but then didn't commit to that. It wasn't a steady progression where the creature would have had to charm or woo her with his ghastly groans and ghostly moans. It didn't go frightened of the undead boy, friends with the undead boy, charmed by the undead boy, romanced by the undead boy. Instead, it hit those marks with some wild spikes in between. So instead, it went frightened of the undead boy to immediately willing to bury a body to hide the crimes that the undead boy committed back down to talking about her other crush to the undead boy, then to friends with the undead boy, followed immediately by willing to end somebody's life to harvest body parts for the undead boy, then back down to telling the undead boy to wait in the car while she goes to seduce her crush. It immediately jumped to romanced by the dead boy. So you see, it was a wild ride. It got there eventually. It did. And I really enjoyed the ending. But the moments where she was, and, and unfortunately the only term for it is friend zoning him, it wasn't done in this nuanced sort of way where it was like, oh no, I can't even admit to myself that I have feelings for this monster. It was more like one second, she was 100% fully in it to win it. Bonnie and Clyde with this, with this, a dead man. And then two seconds later, she was like, <laughs> what if I talked to, to my crush at school? Which it just, it was like, were you not 100% gaga about this guy like eight seconds earlier? Were you not just running your fingers through his hair? Why are you talking about seducing your high school crush when you've got the man of your dead undead dreams in your bed? Like he, I, it just was, just bounced around a lot. The path it took kind of diluted some of the romance and chemistry between the characters for me. Number two, is it funny? Yes, it is funny. It's a dark comedy. Like I said earlier, it had a very Heathers feel to it, which for me is a bit of a double-edged sword because there are some elements of Heathers that I find very funny and then some elements that I'm a little like, ew. Ooh. And that's a bit, that's kind of how this left me. So it was like some parts were really funny and well done that I really enjoyed, but then some parts were like, ooh, ooh, ooh. This is such a garbage review. It's 1.34 in the morning. I'm tired. I'm tired. And I look like this right now at 1.30 in the morning. I look like a Medigliani. Go wonky. I'm just kidding. <laughs> One thing I will say is that it was a bit slower than I expected. Now I've seen Jennifer's body once, but the Diablo Cody movie that I'm most familiar with is Juno. But in both cases, the hallmark of Diablo Cody's screenwriting is the fast paced witty dialogue. This movie's dialogue, maybe because it's following a girl who was recently mute and a resurrected corpse who couldn't speak, 
It felt a little slower or a little less snappy than Juno or Jennifer's body. It didn't take away from the humor. It just didn't seem to... as much as I thought it was going to. I also think the movie had less music and less comedic montages than I was expecting. And that's more of an expectation on my part, but going into it with the trailers and the marketing and the visuals, I just sort of expected the soundtrack to rise to that same level, really dig into the 80s theme. Maybe not go as hard as the Super Mario Bros movie went, but somewhere in that neighborhood, you know? But it actually, had surprisingly few songs. The ones that were in the movie were used really well, but I think because the movie leaned so much into the 80s aesthetic visually, that it felt a little unbalanced and that added to that sort of feeling of being a little slower and a little quieter than expected because it didn't lean into that 80s vibe audibly as well. But despite that, it did have some laugh out loud moments. The performances were great, especially with the two leads. They both really leaned into this sort of very theatrical, dramatic movements and their reactions. Like he took her hand and she like flails. The way that they moved and the, like the reactions they chose were just so fun and over the top and dramatic and it added a lot to the comedy. So it does check that box as well. Finally, we must ask ourselves, is it scary? Yeah, enough. It's definitely more dark comedy than actual horror. I never felt the need to really yell at the screen. But, you know, the crimes are icky. Makes you feel bad. Distressing, in the same way watching Joe Goldberg is distressing. Where you don't really like what he's doing or condone the actions or crimes committed, but because the villain is the hero of the story, you find yourself rooting for them a little bit. And in this movie, our two leads are undeniably the villains of this story. They are two villains falling in love. But because they are our main characters, you find yourself rooting for them along the way, even if they're doing some questionable acts. And that is conflicting and distressing in a way. And remember, we're just looking for something distressing enough to keep you from slipping into despair. And you know what that is? That's all three boxes checked. And you know what that means? It means that I can finally, after 11 years, officially add another movie to the Valentine's roster. I still don't know what to call this genre. Everything I tried workshopping in my car on the way home from the theater was either nonsense sounds or not suitable. The terms Rohrer, Romhorkum, and Romantic Terrorism were proposed and immediately dismissed. So for now, let's say that there are officially two movies in the spooky scary love story category that are just sweet enough to satisfy the romantic mood that Valentine's Day calls for but just spooky enough that you aren't left Googling, can you see who's on Facebook dating without making a profile yourself? Because that's a dark path, brother. And we gotta stay in the light. Okay, happy Valentine's Day, bye.